Hello, my name is Gillian and today is Good Friday, the day when Christians all over the world remember when Jesus was crucified on a cross, an incredibly painful and humiliating way to die. At this time in history, millions of people are isolated in their homes, whether in families, couples, with flatmates or alone. For some, the feeling of abandonment and loneliness are incredibly real. Yes, those of us with technology can keep in touch, but for some, there is no technology which enables them to see friends and family. We know that for a newborn baby to thrive, physical contact is needed. And a lack of physical contact for some people is extremely tough. For me, I really miss hugs and human contact. And seeing family and friends online, or at a distance of two metres or more, helps, but it doesn't meet that inner need. The question many may be asking, though, is, does God understand how we feel? We know that God is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So how does he understand these feelings of abandonment and loneliness? Well, let's look at the hardest moment in Jesus' life when he hung on the cross and died for us. Let's start by reading an account from Matthew chapter 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him, and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took the, off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on, on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you're the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sagatani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine, put it on the 
staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life and they came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. So I'm going to focus on one of the things that Jesus said when he was on the cross. There are seven sayings altogether that are recorded in the different Gospels. And I'm focusing on the fourth saying, the only one recorded in the original language of Aramaic and the only one of the seven sayings recorded in more than one Gospel. As I've already read in Matthew 27 verse 46, it says, Around the ninth hour, Jesus shouted out in a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, which is, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is actually a quote from the very first verse of Psalm 22, which says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? so far from my cries of anguish. So, did God forsake Jesus? What is he saying here? Better yet, why is he saying this? Let's start by looking at the key word in this passage, forsaken. The thesaurus gives all kinds of interesting synonyms for this term. Among them are deserted, disowned, ignored, jilted, forlorn, God-forsaken, lonely, outcast and solitary. The Greek term is likened to our English word abandoned. Both Matthew and Mark in their Gospels say that Jesus uttered these words from the cross. Jesus felt utterly abandoned by God. To feel abandoned is the ultimate in isolation. It is to feel as if you are utterly lost. Child psychologists talk about how infants go through a stage where they fear being abandoned by their parents, as many of you will know. But in particular, mothers. It's a fear that is hardwired in us. A novelist called Rochelle Goodrich has written... Abandoned. The word alone sends shudders down a sensitive spine, troubling the thoughts of pained souls as their hurt swells in ripples. It is a sentence of undesired solitude, often pronounced on the innocent, the trusting, administered without warning or satisfactory cause. Jesus felt this way. How could he not? He was enduring the most horrific of executions. Even though he knew all along that this would happen, experiencing such pain is something altogether different. To suffer such immense pain can easily lead one to feel abandoned by God. If there is nothing else that we can take from this passage, it is the assurance that if Jesus felt this way, it is okay when we feel this way as well. Even most of his disciples had abandoned him at this time. So Christians are not immune from such feelings, but it's how we handle them that is important. The Bible is full of real stories of real people who doubted God too. Maybe God left these verses, chapters and stories to remind us that he can handle our doubts and our fears and knows that we will have them. 
Those moments of uncertainty that arise every now and then are not an affront to God, because God, through Jesus, felt this way too. Jesus is not just fully divine, he is human too. God became human in Christ to experience life as we know it. That includes the entire spectrum of human emotions. Joy, sadness, hope, love, pain, amusement, awe, fear, empathy and doubt, to name but a few. In order for Jesus to fully shoulder the sins of the world and to pay the price for them, God had to momentarily turn his back on him. The human Jesus died on the cross, but of course God did not. The human Jesus died on the cross. Even though Jesus never ceased being God while he was on the cross, it is as if the Spirit of God stepped off the cross for the moment and turned his back so that the human Jesus could truly bear the burden of human sin alone. This would explain why Jesus felt forsaken by his father. N.T. Wright, a former Bishop of Durham and theologian, claims that part of the whole point of the cross is that there the weight of the world's evil really did converge upon Jesus. Blotting out the sunlight of God's love as surely as the light of day was blotted out for three hours. Most, if not all of us, have felt that way too, haven't we? We also cry out wondering why God has seemingly forsaken us. And like the psalmist, we ask, How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? This is the question asked by the parents who have lost their child. This is the sigh of the drug addict searching for their next fix. This is the plea of the underage girl sold into prostitution through an international human trafficking ring. It is understandable why these people feel deserted by God at these times. However, God is with us in those moments more than ever, even though we feel as if he's not. The ultimate symbol of that is Christ himself on the cross. God, his arms outstretched to embrace us in our pain, because he has felt the worst pain of all. That's how much God loves us. That's how much God loves you. He loves us so, so much. If you have any doubts, listen to Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5, which say, Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. I asked the question, God, why have you abandoned me many times when I went through years of depression? I would frequently sit on my bed and would struggle to pray. I would cry out, God, where are you? I need your help. Please take this darkness away. I struggled for years to believe that God loved me. I knew it in my head, but not in my heart. Every year I would go to Christian conferences and on the last night feel that I was the only one there who hadn't heard God's voice or been touched by the Holy Spirit. All around me people would be celebrating and I would be crying as I got more and more miserable. A very wise Christian said to me on one occasion that she felt I was stuck at Good Friday rather than moving on to the joy of the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Day. If you can identify with my feelings there, please do not give up. 
If I had been healed of depression when I was much younger, I wouldn't be the person I am today. So what can we do in our current season of isolation? Remember that faith is not about feelings. Our belief is based on the fact that Jesus died so that we can live a life in relationship with him, knowing that sins are forgiven and that when we die, we will be forever in God's presence in heaven. Let us encourage each other when we communicate and live a life that shows the love of God to those who do not yet know him. This side of heaven, we will never fully know what Jesus was experiencing on the cross. What we do know is that Jesus entered into the hell of separation from God. The Father abandoned him. The Father abandoned him because Jesus took upon himself the penalty for our sins. In that excruciating moment, he experienced something more, far more horrible than physical pain. The beloved Son of God knew what it was like to be rejected by the Father. As we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We can say truly that the Father abandoned the Son for our sake, for the salvation of the world. But can we really grasp the mystery and the majesty of this truth? How can we get our minds around the fact that God, who created the universe out of nothing, in all its beauty and intricacy, chose to separate himself from his son at the time when he was in excruciating pain for hours, so that we can have our relationship with him restored? It blows my mind that God loves each one of the billions of human beings that have been on earth throughout the centuries, including you and me, so much that he chose to do this. Fortunately, we don't need to understand the ways of God, but simply need to acknowledge that we are sinners who have followed our own way and not God's. Place our lives in his hands and by becoming his disciples, reading his word, praying sharing God's truth and love with others, live out our lives seeking to be the one he calls us to be and do what he calls us to do. As Martin Luther once said, God forsaking God, who can understand it? Yet even my minuscule grasp of this reality calls me to confession, to humility, to worship, to adoration. I'd like to finish with a prayer. O oh Lord Jesus, though I will never fully grasp the wonder and horror of your abandonment by the Father, every time I read this word, I am overwhelmed with gratitude. How can I ever thank you for what you suffered for me? What can I do but to offer myself to you in gratitude and praise. Thank you, dear Lord, for what you suffered. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for being forsaken by the Father so that I might never be. Amen. <laughs>